Hello, I'm Alec Kovaleski, Turfgrass Specialist at Oregon State University. And today we're talking about integrated pest management for turf grass. In IPM for turf, there are five cultural practices. From the top down, these cultural practices are mowing, fertilization, and irrigation being the primary cultural practices, as well as cultivation and pest management being the secondary cultural practices. So regardless if you're a homeowner, athletic field manager or golf course superintendent, the most time and money are spent on the primary cultural practices, beginning with mowing, followed by fertilization, then irrigation, with the least amount of time and money spent on cultivation and pest management. As time and budget constraints go into effect, we remove cultural practices from the bottom up, removing pest management first, followed by cultivation, always trying to maintain good primary cultural practices, the mowing, fertilization, and irrigation. Mowing, the primary cultural practice. More time and money is spent on mowing than any other cultural practice. And this is the most important cultural practice when it comes to the successful turf grass stand. So we're going to cover three tips today in relation to mowing. These tips are first, never cut more than one third of the grass blade in a single mowing. Secondly, raise your mowing height and increase your mowing frequency. And finally, mulch your grass clippings. Tip one. Never mow more than one-third of the grass blade in a single mowing. Very simply put, the one-third rule. So mowing more than one-third of the grass blade or violating this one-third rule is going to cause a number of detrimental effects. The most noticeable being scalping, the brown appearance you see after, after mowing more than one-third of the grass blade. Other detrimental effects are going to include depletion of carbohydrates, the turf grass stores its nutrients above ground in the green lush growth you see. So when you mow that off, you rob the plant of its nutrients. It's also going to decrease rooting depth. It's going to shock the plant, making it more susceptible to environmental stresses, drought stress, heat stress. And then this is only further amplified by root feeding insects, which even further compromises the rooting and stress tolerance of the plant. So as we talk specifically about the one-third rule, we're going to take a look down at this research plot here at the Lewis Brown uh, Horticulture Farm at Oregon State University. We see a number of different mowing heights here. The grass here in front of me is maintained at a two-inch mowing height. The grass here that I'm standing on is maintained at a half-inch mowing height. And these are the extreme ranges for perennial ryegrass. And if I were to suggest a, a preferred mowing height, as we'll talk about later, higher is better in my opinion. And as you look at these different heights, the two inch grass here is gonna have to be mowed once a week to keep it within that one third rule, never mowing more than one third of the grass blade in a single mowing. The grass here that I'm standing on that's maintained at a half of an inch, it's gonna require very frequent mowing, maybe two or three times a week to prevent it from scalping off or mowing more than one third of the grass blade in a single mowing. Tip two in relation to successful mowing is raising your mowing height and increasing your mowing frequency. Raising your mowing height is directly correlated to deeper rooting. The higher the grass is mowed, the deeper the plant roots into the ground. This is illustrated very well with these two samples. The sample on the left here is maintained at a two inch height and you can see very deep roots down to about a four inch depth into the soil. And then if we compare that to this sample on the right here, which is maintained at a tenth of an inch, you see rooting depth down to only about an inch and a half into the soil. Not only will mow increasing your mowing height increase your rooting depth, but it also decrease weed encroachment. So weed seeds fly in from all over the place existing or surrounding areas such as uh, ag fields, uh, unmaintained areas where the weeds are high in populations. The weed seeds float in and they land on the turf grass. And the weeds then make it down through the uh, grass to the soil surface, building the weed seed bank. And in the low mowed grass, where the weeds make it down to the soil surface, sunlight can then penetrate down through the turf canopy, 
germinating the weeds, allowing them to establish. And then as you mo move over into higher maintained grass, the grass catches the sunlight as it comes down, uses it for carbohydrate production and prevents the weed seeds from germinating that are down at the soil, soil surface there at the bottom of the turf grass canopy. So as we take a close look at these two different mowing heights, we see a lot of annual bluegrass encroachment here at the low maintained mowing height. And then as we move over here to the higher maintained mowing height, we see much less annual bluegrass encroachment. And again, that's a direct correlation to the mowing height. The higher height being correlated to the less annual bluegrass encroachment. So the two dominant grasses in the state of Oregon and Washington are going to be perennial ryegrass along the coast and Kentucky bluegrass as you move inland across the mountains. Both of these grasses are going to do very well at a three inch mowing height. As you take this mowing height down lower, approaching an inch or lower than that, you start to get more and more weed encroachment as well as more and more stress, environmental stresses that the grasses cannot uh, uh, grow out of. So the second half of tip two is increasing your mowing frequency. And to illustrate this point, we're going to use the example of the highway roadside. So the highway is maintained at a very low mowing height, probably once a month. And it's some of the worst turf you see across the state. This time of year it becomes very brown, very thin, tons of weeds in there and it's all related to the low mowing height and the low mowing frequency. You need to increase your mowing height and increase your frequency. And the height is also relative to the frequency. If we go back down to this grass here, we see the higher maintained grass at two inches needing about uh, average mowing of once a week to maintain it at that height but not violate the one-third rule. This is going to provide a very healthy grass stand that tolerates a lot of environmental stresses and is resistant to weed seed encroachment. Then as we move over to the lower cut grass, because of the low mowing height, this grass is going to require very frequent mowing as much as three times a week to prevent you from scalping the grass when it's maintained at this height. Again, if we go back to the grasses used in Washington and Oregon, the dominant grasses are perennial ryegrass on the coast and then Kentucky bluegrass as you move inland. And again, these grasses should be maintained, in my opinion, around a three inch height. The higher the height you go, the more stress environmental tolerances you're gonna have from the grass. So weed encroachment associated with a low mowing height include annual bluegrass, common dandelion, and crabgrass. So tip three for successful mowing is mulching your grass clippings. By removing the bag from your mower, and using mulching blades like this double set of blades here, we can return as much as two pounds of nitrogen per year into the turf grass stand, which is a considerable amount of fertilizer when we're trying to achieve annual rates of three to five pounds of nitrogen, which are suggested for Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass. So by adhering to the one-third rule, using a mulching blade like this, we can easily return a significant amount of organic fertilizer with the grass clippings to the soil. This area here illustrates the importance of the one-third rule increasing your mowing height and increasing your mowing frequency in relation to mulching your clippings back into the turf grass stand. Here while the mowing height may be adequate right around three inches the frequency is not. Therefore we see these large windrows accumulating on the surface here. These windrows of grass clippings can smother the turf if they accumulate too much and are very unsightly for high performance turf grass situations like athletic fields or golf courses. And as you look across the surface here, you see a large number of broadleaf weeds encroaching into the site. 
And this is probably associated with the frequent scalping. The grass is not being mowed frequently enough, so when it is mowed, it's scalping the turf, opening the canopy, allowing sunlight to penetrate down to the weed seed bank. So the second of the three primary cultural practices is fertilization. And the three tips we'll discuss today in reference to fertilization is first, select a fertilizer designed for turf. Secondly, use a rotary spreader and not a drop spreader. And finally, the holiday fertilization plan. So tip one, selecting a fertilizer for turf grass. If we come down here and take a look at this bag of fertilizer here, we see it's uh, clearly na named or labeled turf fertilizer. We have three primary nutrients being nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So these are the essential turf grass nutrients with the highest concentration, the most important nutrient being nitrogen, followed by potassium, and then finally phosphorus. And if we move from this bag over to the second bag, we now see a product labeled 23010. And this would be an appropriate product for homeowners in the state of Washington. There is a ban on fertilizer containing phosphorus in the state of Washington. And the reason for this is because products that contain phosphorus can result in accelerated eutrophication. So as these fertilizers with phosphorus enter into waterways, ponds, and lakes, they generate algae blooms. The algae then die and microorganisms in the water decompose the algae using up the oxygen in the water. This ultimately results in the death of the pond system. Animals and other things requiring oxygen in the water will then die. So the second tip to successful fertilization is using a rotary spreader rather than a drop spreader to apply your product. So the problem with a drop spreader is once we load this fertilizer spreader with our product, we open the stem here, we make our application, we close it, we turn around for our second pass. We now have to apply our second pass right over top of the wheel pass we made for the first application to get even coverage, which is very hard across a large surface area like this field. The rotary spreader, on the other hand, when we open this fertilizer spreader, the product comes out and hits this propeller here, which throws the product into a large arc. The majority of the product lands here in front of the fertilizer spreader, and as you get further and further away from the center, the product gets to lower and lower amounts. Then we generally use a 10 to 8 foot uh, turnaround period for our second pass as we come over the surface area to provide a very uniform coverage over a large surface area. It's not as important to be accurate on our overlap. So the third tip to successful fertilization is the holiday fertility plan. So with this plan, the goal is to apply three to five pounds of nitrogen per thousand feet annually, broken up into four applications. So the first application, which can be made at a rate of a pound to a pound and a half, should be made on Memorial Day. The second application, which should be applied at a reduced rate, a half to a pound of nitrogen per thousand feet should be made on July 4th. The third application then made again at a reduced rate of a half to a pound of nitrogen per thousand feet on Labor Day. And then the final application now at an increased rate at a pound to a pound and a half on Thanksgiving. The reason we do this is because cool season grass such as perennial ryegrass and Kentucky bluegrass the dominant grasses in our part of the world, have a diurnal growth pattern with heavy growth in the spring and the fall, 
very little growth in the summer as heat and drought stress sets in and then again little growth in the winter when temperatures are relatively cool. Three weeds that we're going to wrap up with related to low fertility include white clover, false dandelion, and plantain. So just remember these four dates, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, and Thanksgiving. The third primary cultural practice that we're going to discuss is irrigation. And the three tips we'll be covering are first, know your precipitation rates. Secondly, adjust your irrigation rates with the season. And finally, twice as much is not twice as good. So the first tip is know your precipitation rates. And more specifically, what is the depth of water you're applying in an irrigation event rather than the time? This can vary substantially from irrigation head to irrigation head. For instance, a pop-up sprayer can apply a tenth of an inch of irrigation in as little as five minutes while a rotary sprayer may apply the same amount of water in as much as 20 minutes. So in this point, we're going to demonstrate an irrigation audit. And you're going to see three steps. The first is placing the catch cans across the irrigation area that you're going to audit. Second, run the irrigation system for a half an hour, 30 minutes. Third, Look at the irrigation depth in the various catch cans and use that to develop an average irrigation depth per the 30 minutes. We're going to then use that to develop an irrigation rate targeting two tenths of an inch of irrigation. So the reason we're using two tenths of an inch of irrigation per event as our general guide is because a loamy soil, which is very typical of this part of the United States, uh, can only hold about 0 0.06 inches of water per inch of soil. Therefore, if we irrigate two tenths of an inch, it's going to wet the soil to a three inch depth. And if we take a look back to our turf sample here, remember this is a very shallow rooted plant. The maximum rooting depth uh, is only going to reach a few inches, and the vast majority of the roots are going to be in the top three and four inches of the soil. So other problems associated with irrigation events greater than two tenths of an inch is precipitation rates will often exceed infiltration rates. Therefore if you put down more than two tenths of an inch of water the water has a tendency to run off the surface. And if we exceed two tenths of an inch and it does happen to drain into the soil often the water will drain past the root depth which we previously discussed. Tip two to proper irrigation is adjusting your irrigation rates with the seasons. In our part of the world we have a temperate climate which has the vast majority of its rainfall through the fall, winter, and spring months with a very droughty summer period. Therefore, we need to adjust our rates to compensate for this summer heat stress, which is exactly the time when cool season turf, which is the dominant grass species in our part of the world as well, also needs the vast majority of water. So in the spring and the fall, we're going to target our rates from 0 to 0.75 inches per week, depending on your specific environment and location. And then as we move into the summer months, we're going to increase our rates from an inch to inch and a half, again, depending on your particular situation. So if we then reference back our two tenths of an inch of irrigation per event, if we irrigate five times a week at two tenths of an inch, that'll put us at an inch of water per week, which will get us at the beginning of our inch to inch and a half rate for the summer. And then we can adjust the rates accordingly if we need to. So the third tip to successful irrigation is twice as much is not twice as good. Over irrigation is going to result in runoff of nutrients and pesticides that you've applied. Runoff of fertilizers containing phosphorus are going to accelerate processes like eutrophication which we've previously discussed. And 
over irrigation is also going to result in leaching of nutrients and pesticides through the soil. You're also wasting water when you're creating surface runoff and leaching. So some things associated with over irrigation include annual bluegrass, rough bluegrass, moss, and crane fly. Here we are at Lauren's Field at Oregon State University and the point of this visit is to illustrate the importance of frequent mowing, proper fertilization, and proper irrigation. So this soccer field, which is host to the men's and women's soccer team at Oregon State, receives mowing three to four times a week, fertilization five to six times a year, heavy applications in the spring and the fall, totaling around six pounds of nitrogen per thousand feet per year, and daily irrigation through the summer heat stress period between a tenth and two tenths of an inch of irrigation. Again, targeting right around an inch of water a week. And if we just take a look at this field, we can see the benefits of proper implementation of these three primary cultural practices. So now that we've completed our primary cultural practices, mowing, fertilization, and irrigation, we're going to move into our secondary cultural practices, which include cultivation and pest management. So starting with cultivation, when picking a cultivation method, time, or reason, there are three objectives that we want to complete. Those objectives are, first, relieving soil compaction. Secondly, improving drainage and air movement. And third, reducing organic matter. So if these three things are not a problem on your turf area, there's no reason for you to core cultivate or aerify. In reference to that, grasses that grow stoloniferously, like creeping bent grass on a putting green, or rhizominously, like Kentucky bluegrass in the eastern half of Washington and Oregon, are going to require regular cultivation. Grasses like perennial ryegrass, however, which are bunch-type grasses, will not need regular core cultivation or aerification. So, again, reminding you, do you have soil compaction, organic matter accumulation, or is drainage a factor? Those are the three things that we should assess before choosing a cultivation method. So there are all types of different core cultivation or aerification units that you can use. And in my opinion, hollow tying core cultivation is the most advantageous. So if we look down at this bottom of this unit here, this is a hollow tine core harvester. So it punches hollow holes into the soil and removes cores. And the reason I think this is such a good unit is because it satisfies all three of those objectives in choosing cultivation. It's going to relieve soil compaction, it's going to improve gas exchange and drainage, and it's going to remove organic matter that's accumulated over time. So once we've gone through and run our core cultivator on this area, we need to either remove these cores from the surface of the grass or incorporate them back into the soil. Uh, we are going to incorporate the cores back into the soil using a, a steel drag mat or a hand rake and then we can remove cores using a flat end shovel. So once you've taken your drag mat over the surface, if there's any remaining material, some choose to run a rotary mower over top of this. You can either rotary mulch that back into the ground or pull it off with a bagger. So once you've completed your core cultivation, uh, harvested your cores, or dragged them back into the surface or raked them into the ground, it's a great time to intercede your existing turf grass stand to try and build the turf back up. This is an important practice, particularly when managing perennial ryegrass. Remember, this is a bunch type grass, so it does not spread laterally so it cannot repair from traffic, can't fill in after areas become bare. So we're going to intercede perennial ryegrass into areas like this. If you're managing Kentucky bluegrass, I would also suggest interceding perennial ryegrass into those areas as well. The reason being perennial ryegrass will germinate in 7 to 10 days, 
while the bluegrass takes 21 to 28 days to germinate. When selecting the seed, <clears throat> you're going to apply it uh, with a drop spreader and apply it at 8 to 10 pounds per thousand feet using the drop spreader. Here we are at the Tristing Tree Golf Course and we're illustrating the importance of core cultivation or thatch management using a golf course putting green. The creeping bent grass on this putting green has very aggressive stoloniferous growth which will accumulate thatch in this layer here. This thatch is very closely related to the disease problems you have on most golf courses. So the better you can do at managing this thatch, the less disease you'll have on your golf course. This golf course receives cultivation twice annually as well as verticutting and top dressing all summer long which provides very good organic matter accumulation control which relates to less pesticides when disease, managing the diseases on the golf course. As we relate cultivation back to integrated pest management, a weed that is a particular indicator of a compacted soil is not weed. And finally, let's review the cultural practices that we've covered so far. We should be mowing at a relatively high height, around three inches, once a week at a minimum. We should be fertilizing four times a year, twice in the spring, twice in the fall. We should be irrigating, particularly during the summer months, around an inch per week, broken up into two-tenths of an inch applications. And we should be cultivating as well, particularly in situations when we have grasses that have rhizominous or stoloniferous growth habits, like Kentucky bluegrass or creeping bent grass. So as we finalize this part of the, the project, you should remember we should not revert to pesticides until we have exhausted proper mowing, proper fertilization, proper irrigation, and proper cultivation. It's only after we've successfully implemented these cultural practices that we should consider pesticide applications. For the final part of this training, we'll be covering pest management. The three things we'll be highlighting here are first, the pest triangle, secondly, pesticide mixing, loading, and application, and finally, the control of three different pests, weeds, diseases, and insects. So first, let's talk about the pest triangle. The pest triangle, regardless of the pest you're managing, a weed, a disease, an insect, has three parts to it. The host, the pest, and the environment, which is a very important or critical part to integrated pest management. Here we see a perfect example of this. The host is perennial ryegrass. It was seeded as a pure stand of grass. Then over time, the fertility became deficient. So the host is perennial ryegrass, the environment is a nutrient deficient soil and the pest now is white clover, the weed that does very well in low fertility situations. Then if I take a few steps forward, we see another perfect example of this pest triangle here. Again, an area that was seeded as perennial ryegrass, it was nutrient deficient and now rather than a weed, we see a disease here, red thread, an indication of poor fertility. So here we have two different pests, a weed, which was white clover, and a disease, red thread, which are both indicators or pests that do very well in low fertility environments. So probably the first solution to the problem here is increasing the fertility. Regarding pesticide mixing, loading, and personal protective equipment, remember to always consult the pesticide label. The pesticide label is your reference for all these different things. Uh, mixing, loading, pests that are properly controlled by the pesticide, the proper host that the pesticide can be applied to, and the proper personal protective equipment for the various products that you're applying. So remember, always consult the label, 
It'll make sure that you're in compliance with Department of Agriculture regulations. In reference to personal protective equipment, always consult the label. Some minimal PPE include things like boots, socks, shoes, long pants, long sleeve shirt, and gloves. To summarize mixing, loading, and application of pesticides, in turf grass management, products are typically applied at one to two gallons of water per thousand feet. This is very important because adequate uniform surface coverage will successfully ensure proper use of your products. To conclude our pest management section, we're now going to focus on the control of broadleaf weeds, more specifically white clover and false dandelion, pathogens being red thread and necrotic ring spot, and finally the control of an insect, European crane fly. So at this point we're going to discuss control of two broadleaf weeds, the first being false dandelion. False dandelion is a perennial broadleaf weed with a deep-rooted taproot system. This taproot system allows the weed to persist well in dry, droughty, summer stress conditions. This weed is typically an indication that you have not been watering your lawn. It's often one of the only weeds or plants that stays green in the unirrigated lawn through the summer. In areas where this weed is not mowed regularly, it produces a large seed stalk and then a bright yellow flower at the end. So broadleaf herbicides that we can use for post-emergent control of weeds like false dandelion, common dandelion, and the thistles are three and four way mixtures containing 2,4-D. 2,4-D is the most important active ingredient for this group of weeds. This product here, Trimet Classic, is the first example. So active ingredients in here are 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba. The next product we're going to cover is Speed Zone, which has these same three active ingredients, as well as Carfentrazone, which is a fourth broadleaf weed herbicide. And the final product we'll look at is Q4. So this four-way herbicide mixture includes 2,4-D, Dicamba, as well as Quincrolac and Sulfentrazone. This is a nice product to include in our list as well because Quincrolac will provide very effective control of crabgrass in lawns that have this weed as well. So the next broadleaf weed that we'll cover is white clover. So here I have an example of white clover that's growing in combination with perennial ryegrass. So this broadleaf weed is a good indicator that you're not putting down enough nitrogen on your turf. It is a legume, and like other legumes, soybean for example, it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. So it is very often an indicator that you're not putting down adequate amounts of nitrogen. If I set this sample down and then pick up another sample of white clover here, we can see the stoloniferous growth habit of this weed, which allows it to creep over the surface as it grows perennially. Again, the weed growing with its stolons across the surface. And then if we take a very close look here, we can see some nodules forming on the roots of the white clover where the fixed nitrogen from the atmosphere goes. White clover, however, is often tolerant to 2,4-D, the major active ingredient in products like Trimet Classic, which we discussed earlier. Other weeds that are tolerant to 2,4-D include English Daisy, Black Medic, as well as Wild Violet. So for control of this group of weeds, we're going to look for products with triclopyr. 
An example of such a product here is T-Zone. T-Zone has triclopyr as the first active ingredient as well as sulfentrazone and the ingredients 2,4-D and dicamba. To summarize our weed control section, if you apply a herbicide to take white clover out of your existing stand of grass and you don't change your fertility, mowing, or irrigation practices, you can expect the white clover to return to those areas. Remember, after herbicide applications are made, you need to get the proper primary cultural practices, mowing fertilization, into effect, or weeds will only return to the areas where they previously existed. At this point in pest management, we're going to cover the control of two different pathogens, red thread and necrotic ring spot. First is red thread. So red thread is a disease that's very damaging to perennial ryegrass in low fertility situations. Typically when we find this disease, it's an indicator that we're not achieving our recommended rate of nitrogen per year, which was three to five pounds annually. And it gets the name red thread because of the mycelium, which gives it this red appearance. The pathogen spreads across the surface of the leaves, and when it dries out in the sun, it provides this pinkish, reddish, hard mycelium on the surface of the leaves. So typically, control of this pathogen can be easily provided by adequate fertilization. And remember that's three to five pounds of nitrogen applied four times, twice in the spring, twice in the fall. And this disease also can be controlled in high priority situations, high value situations when the fertilizer has not been effective with a broad number of contact or systemic fungicides. The second pathogen that we'll cover today is necrotic ring spot. Necrotic ring spot is very specific to Kentucky bluegrass. The reason being, Kentucky bluegrass is a rhizominous grass spreading laterally underground. These rhizomes develop organic matter over time. As organic matter increases, the root-borne pathogen necrotic ring spot will be, become worse and worse because the pathogen not only fall, feeds on the turf but also on the organic matter that accumulates in the soil profile. This pathogen has a very interesting life cycle. Initial affections typically begin in the fall months and the spring months when the environmental conditions are wet and cool. However, symptoms are not visible this time of year. It is very good growing conditions for grass like Kentucky bluegrass, the cool wet weather. So as the pathogen infects the turf, we often do not see the symptoms until we enter into the summer period when heat and drought affect, decrease the health of the turf. The pathogen is not very active this time of year. However, the grass, because the root system has been compromised by the pathogen, succumbs to the summer heat and drought stress. This is very important because when we consider fungicide applications, a fungicide application, when the symptoms are present during the summer, will not control the pathogen because the pathogen infected the turf back in the previous fall and spring months. We need to make preventative applications in the spring and the fall before the symptoms are present. Symptoms of this pathogen initiate as small, necrotic, brown or yellow patches that grow larger and larger. As these patches get larger to about an eight inch in diameter, grass will often recover in the center of these patches. You then have a necrotic circle or ring with grass outside the ring and grass inside the ring. We often commonly refer to this symptom as the frog eye, which is very typical of necrotic ring spot. In terms of control of necrotic ring spot, we're going to use cultivation and fungicides. Remember, this 
disease is specific to Kentucky bluegrass, which has the aggressive rhizominous underground growth, which accumulates organic matter. The pathogen feeds on the organic matter as well as the grass. So reducing organic matter through frequent core cultivation is very important. Cultivating twice a year can substantially reduce your necrotic ring spot infection and activity. In terms of fungicides, the two major active ingredients that are going to be effective on this pathogen include DMI fungicides such as propiconazole, which has the common name Banner Max, as well as azoxystrobin, known as Heritage. Another product that is very effective on this pathogen is Headway, which is a mixture of the active ingredients propiconazole and azoxystrobin. And again, remember these applications need to may, be made preventatively in the spring or fall months rather than in the summer months when the, pre, the symptoms are present. Management of European crane fly will be the last pest that we discuss. This insect is a diptera or member of the fly family which also inclu includes common crane fly. It is easily identified by the long thin legs and the large membranous net vein wings that are held out against the body when the insect is at rest. Turf grass areas adjacent to wetlands are very particular to crane fly habitat. These insects prefer very moist wet soils when finding areas to lay their, lay their eggs. So typically grass that is adjacent or next to ponds, lakes, various wetlands, low-lying areas that drain water, or areas that are over-irrigated or shady are very typical of crane fly habitat. So things that we can do to dry out the soil surface will reduce crane fly infestations. A general recommendation is if you have a history of crane fly infestations, turn your irrigation system off on Labor Day. This will decrease the crane fly populations and it will not be very detrimental to the turf because during this time of year heat is reducing and the seasonal rains typically are coming in to the fall season so environmental stresses are not as a concern for turf grass. So adult European crane fly emer emerge from the soil in mid-August to October. They quickly find a mate reproduce and then lay eggs. The eggs take about a two week, two week period to hatch. The larvae then go through several instar beginning in the fall through the winter into the summer months. During these instars we should be doing our scouting in December and January about the third instar stage. This is when the larvae are the most active and will often find the highest concentration of larva. For scouting we can use a square end shovel like this. We're going to make a square hole down to about a three inch depth in the soil and then flip over that piece of soil. We're looking for concentrations of 20 to 50 larvae per square feet. The number of larvae that determine our action threshold is going to be ten dependent on the successful mowing, fertilization, and irrigation. If we're not doing these cultural practices successfully, we'll have a lower action threshold, closer to 20 larvae per square foot, where we start to see thinning turf. If the, if the cultural practices are maintained at adequate levels, regular mowing, regular fertilization in the spring and the fall, and adequate fertilization in the summer will have higher action thresholds of 50 larvae per square feet or even greater before we start to see thinning turf. The larvae will complete their life cycles in the late spring, early summer months, go into pupation in July and then emerge again as adults in mid-August. For control of these insects, when we've reached an action threshold of 20 to 50 or even more larvae, depending on our cultural practices, we have a number of different active ingredients that are effective on early 
and then late instar stages. Products effective on early instar periods of this insect, which again would be the early winter months, include imidacloprid, which is also known as the product merit. There is some danger associated with this product in relation to bees. It has been known to kill bees and does kill bees. However, when we apply it to a turf grass situation, the risk is very low because turf is not a flowering plant. To summarize this training, let's review the primary and secondary cultural practices. The primary cultural practices were mowing, fertilization, and irrigation. In reference to mowing, remember a high mowing height around three inches for perennial ryegrass and Kentucky bluegrass is best. And frequent mowing, at least once a week. In reference to fertilization, Remember, three to five pounds of nitrogen per thousand feet. Two applications made in the spring months and two applications made in the fall months, avoiding applications in the winter months. In terms of irrigation, remember, two tenths of an inch of irrigation per application is best. It prevents runoff and leaching. During the peak summer months when it's very droughty and you have a lot of heat stress, remember, one to one and a half inches of irrigation. If you put down two tenths of an inch of irrigation five times a week, that's one inch per week. Now the secondary cultural practices were cultivation and pest management. Remember you need cultivation in situations where you have laterally spreading grasses like Kentucky bluegrass or creeping bent grass. These grasses produce a lot of thatch which encourages disease development. Use core cultivation in the spring and the fall to reduce thatch and organic matter, as well as compaction, poor drainage, and air movement into the soil. And the second of the two secondary cultural practices, pest management. Remember, we're only relying on pesticides, whether they're herbicides, fungicides, or insecticides, after proper mowing, fertilization, irrigation, and cultivation have failed to provide adequate turf grass stands. When we consider the various pesticides, remember to get proper pest identification before selecting a product and a time to put down that product.